So um, from here, from this list, we're giving uh, you line by line uh, information that you will use to fill up the form. Uh, sale price is $470,000, and it's mentioned here that it's both a debit and a credit. The sales price is, a, is an amount of money that the buyer is paying for as a debit, and it's the amount of money that the seller is receiving as a credit. I'll show you that on the spreadsheet in just a moment. We have to look up what the buyer's loan amount is, um, that came from the purchase agreement, how much their initial deposit amount was, that's also all this information is coming from the amount. And uh, going through a bunch of different things, we, we calculated uh, what the seller is paying for in the commissions to both the seller's broker and the buyer's broker. Keep in mind, in real estate transactions, traditionally the seller pays both brokerages the commission. There was no seller's loan to pay off, so we're not going to have to pay off any existing liens. The house was free and clear. Now, one of the major parts that you completed for exercise size one was what the prorated tax amount was. And, uh, many of you got that, some it was a little bit of a challenge, but uh, just keep in, mind, keep in mind the steps that you took. Number one, uh, we have to know what the date of the closing is. In our exercise, we had said that the six months second half payment of taxes had not been paid. That total amount of tax was $538.17. The question from that exercise one was, how much of it is prorated that the seller pays of that total amount, and how much remaining would the buyer pay? And that proration amount is based on the date of the escrow closing. So in this, you have to calculate uh, this process, and uh, we'll give you a hint on that in a second. And then we have other charges in here that you'll go down by the line items. The buyer's loan origination, appraisal fee, and credit report. Where it says your buyer received a credit. That should give you a hint whether it's a debit or credit from the buyer. This is a credit from the lender. This is money that the lender is paying in to cover um, the sum of money. But to reduce the amount of closing costs. I mean, in essence, because the buyer decided to get a, higher, a little bit higher quarter point interest rate, a fixed interest rate increase. So, in other words, the lender gave them some credit towards their closing in exchange for a little bit higher interest rate. And that's something that does happen from time to time. So the title company plays a huge important role um, okay, in the so real estate because they are doing there's a, a loan amount interest for the buyer that must be paid as of the closing April the 24th. So you have to um, calculate uh, that amount. It's seven days at $47.64 daily interest. Remember, the buyers pay interest from the moment that they close escrow, um, regardless of their mortgage payment, which would actually be one month past um, the end of the month. Um, would be their first but date, but that's their review. Really it's not material for this calculation. Is there basically that closing in April? The first payment would be June first. But the interest is paid throughout, and uh, the seven days get you from the date of closing until the end of April. And then the first month's payment in June uh, covers the interest uh, for May. Okay, um, hazard insurance by the buyer. Uh, it's a buyer charge. Um, that's for charges. I'm only saying as for us to charge 50 50 split, that means you take the total escrow amount, you cut it in half, and it's a charge to both the buyer and the seller. Um, both buyer and seller are paying an escrow wire transfer fee and wire transfer funds, so they both have to pay that fee. Um, there's a tie in fee on the buyer, that's an extra escrow charge. Um, the seller's paying for the preliminary, or excuse me, for the title insurance policy, there's a charge for that. And then the lenders are making the buyer pay for their title insurance policy as a part of the lender's closing costs. So that charge is also there. And as you read down, um, we remember the documentary transfer tax. We did that in assignment one as well. You calculated that amount, which came up to $570. And then other parts that came from the purchase agreement. And there was no uh, termite report requirement in the contract, so there's no termite charge for the repairs or for the report. So now we're going to go in uh, real quick to the spreadsheet. Okay, I'm not going to fill all this in for you. That's your assignment to give you, and you'll be turning it into me as your professor. And ultimately, the escrow officer relying on your information. But as you're looking at this sheet, you'll see the line items in here. Now, this is blank, and I filled this in to get you started.
but we do have the calculated escrow closing date as we did in assignment one, which came out to be April the 24th of 2019. Why is this date important? For proration purposes, for example, on the property taxes, you had to calculate how many days from January 1st to April 24th, literally how many days. And from that, you calculated the uh, daily rate of proration amount, which came out to a dollar figure multiplied by the number of days, and that was the seller's property tax proration from the total amount. And the remaining amount would then be applied towards the buyer as they're paying the rest of that amount. Now, I mentioned when we talked about the purchase price of 470, of the buyers buying the home and they're paying it's a debit on their column for 470, and the seller is receiving that payment of 470,000. That would be a credit on their side. Keep in mind that unlike accounting, this uh, type of debit credits on these columns for seller and buyer, it's not like every line item has a debit on one side and a credit on another. It's not like accounting in this case. You're only applying if there is a fee charged to that party as a debit or if there's money received by that party as a credit. Okay, so usually whatever amounts you're putting in are only on the seller side or only on the buyer side. Unless I indicated, for example, the escrow fee of 50-50, they're both paying it and both would be a debit. So I entered in here um, the loan amount and I entered in, excuse me, I entered in the purchase price of 470. Now the buyer is getting a loan from the lender, and that's 376000 And you'll see that I indicated that's a credit. That's something they're going to pay in the future, monthly payments for the next 30 years. So it is not a debit. You don't want to add 470 and 376. What we're doing is subtracting these two amounts, and from that, and then adding in charges to find out how much is their down payment and closing costs total combined. Now, also to get started over here on the seller side, they have commissions that they're paying. So I indicated the seller brokerage is 3% commission. You'll fill in the buyer brokerage is 2% commission. These are things you calculated in, in exercise number one. There's no payoff of the seller loan, so just letting you know that's a zero. But then you're going to have the prorations. So property tax prorations, the seller is paying an amount and the buyer is paying their amount of the proration. So those are both obviously going to be debits. And just going down the line and filling in the other things as you've been instructed in this exercise. What I'll show you at the bottom is where your columns balance out for debits on the buyer's side of 470 so far, although it's going to be a different amount when you finish, and how many credits towards the buyer. And what happens on the spreadsheet, this calculates automatically. And at the bottom here, it will tell you at the end of the exercise what is the total amount the buyer must bring in in funds for the closing. This is very important because when the escrow officer is sitting down with their buyer and they're signing the loan documents, they're going to tell the buyer, okay, you must now wire in X amount of dollars, which will be indicated here on the spreadsheet. They can wire those in. They will have the funds then available with the loan amount that comes in uh, to have all the funds ready to prepare the closing. And then over on this side, they can present the seller and say, yes, you sold the home for 470 but after all the costs of the transaction, what you'll actually take home in that proceeds will be this amount. So, so you get a general understanding of this form, and again, you'll be filling in all the line items as described in the instructions. So again, um, you know, uh, read again the, the chapter in the book, um, go through the exercise, look at figure 6-4. If you have any general questions, obviously you can shoot me a message at any time. Uh, good luck on completing this assignment. I think you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about settlement sheets and debits and credits. And again, thank you very much and look forward to your submissions. While other banks are basically saying that they are exempt because of federal law. So what that means in everyday real estate is that you often have to fight for the SRPD when the property is owned by a bank. Now, who is exempt 
from the SRPD. Well, in new construction, there is no SRPD. Uh, also, co-owners of property, uh, if you've got a situation, let's say, where a husband and wife own a property, and now the husband and wife are going to sell that property to the husband only. In other words, the wife is going to remove herself from ownership for whatever reason. Uh, they would be exempt from the mandate of providing an SRPD. Uh, also, uh, trustees, uh, since they are only um, temporarily taking over the property, would be exempt. And also, close family members are exempt. And if you want to know exactly what Nevada law it says, family members within the third degree of consanguinity are exempt from the mandate of providing an SRPD. And when we're talking about the third degree of consanguinity, that would include parents and children, would include siblings, aunts, uncles, uh, grandparents, and grandchildren. So all of those groups of indi individuals are exempt as per Nevada law. Keep in mind, banks are not exempt. And of course, in a short sale, we do get the SRPD as well because it is the seller of the property who still owns it. It is not a bank who takes possession of the property in a short sale. You know, nothing prevents you from requesting an SRPD prior to writing an offer. I know that that is not very common practice here in Southern Nevada. However, in many states, it is common for a buyer's agent to contact a listing agent when they're contemplating writing an offer and to request that SRPD. So there's nothing in Nevada statutes that uh, prohibits a buyer's agent from asking for that SRPD. I'd like to bring your attention to a form. Uh, please go ahead and get that form in front of you right now. Make sure you have the handout for every video, of course. And this one is known as the Buyer's Acknowledgement and Release. So go ahead and pause this video if you need to, but you have to have this one in front of you, like all handouts. Now, if you look at the top of the buyer's acknowledgement and release, it does say as a sub subtitle, in parentheses, no SRPD or incomplete SRPD. In my opinion, an incomplete SRPD is basically the same thing as not providing an SRPD at all, right? Uh, because Nevada law requires the seller of the residential property to disclose any known material defects. I pause so that you understand what the law says. Sellers must dis disclose known. So this is not a substitute for an inspection. If they don't know about something, then they don't know about it, and therefore they're not required to disclose it. And they must disclose known material defects, so not cosmetic defects. If you watched my video series, Class 2, uh, I talked about the differences between material and cosmetic defects. So the law requires only the disclo disclosure of known material defects. And this buyer's acknowledgement and release form is really, really critical in the situation where the seller has not provided an SRPD or has not provided a completed SRPD. So, as you can see, the property address goes at the top, and then it says, I, the buyer, as the buyer in a purchase transaction of the above entitled property, hereby acknowledge and agree to the following. Paragraph 1, Nevada law requires the seller of the above entitled property unless exempt, and now you know who's exempt. To provide buyer with a completed form known as an SRPD disclosing any defects in the property of which the seller is aware at least 10 days prior to conveyance. So just note that that is the deadline the seller has to provide this SRPD. Now, as a matter of uh, everyday business, typically the SRPD is provided by the listing agent to the buyer's agent within a few days of opening escrow. But statutorily, there is that deadline of 10 days prior to COE. Paragraph 2 says, the seller is prohibited from requesting or requiring the buyer to waive the form and other rights under 
expert in Nevada law that a buyer is prohibited from waiving the form and other rights. The language of the law as revised can be found on the SRPD. Paragraph 3 says there may be transactions where the seller, in violation of the law, fails to provide or fully complete the SRPD. If the seller of this property does not provide you with the SRPD or does not disclose a defect, the battle law provides certain remedies. What are those remedies? Number one, you have the right to rescind, which means to take back or to cancel the purchase agreement without penalty, meaning the buyer is going to get the earnest money deposit back. And if there is a defect which was not disclosed, you may have the right to recover treble damages, which means three times the actual cost of the repair or the replacement. If a seller requests that you waive any of your rights or legal remedies under Nevada law or otherwise, you should contact an attorney so you understand the consequences. Your agent cannot explain the legal consequences of waiving your legal remedies. Of course, that would be practicing law without a license. Paragraph 4 says, if the seller does inform you through the SRPD or another written notice of a defect in the property, According to Nevada law, you may, one, rescind the purchase agreement within four business days of receiving the SRPD at any time before the conveyance of the property, or go ahead and close the escrow, accept the property with the defect as revealed by the seller or his agent without further recourse. Paragraphs 5 and 6 are really important. It says in paragraph 5, with full knowledge of the nature of the the SRPD requirements and the remedies available under the law, buyer is choosing to move forward with the transaction. So paragraph 5, again being very important, requires its own initials and what it's saying is that the buyer has not received the SRPD or not received a completed SRPD, but he doesn't care. He's willing to move forward and take possession of the property. Uh, not very smart, in my opinion, but when you're dealing with the decision to buy a home, which you might remember from my video series, Class 1, is 75% based on emotions. Buyers do get emotionally uh, involved and attached to the property, and they can make a decision like this. Paragraph 6, the buyer makes the decision to purchase independent of the real estate brokers involved in the transaction and hereby agrees to hold the buyer's broker and agent in this transaction harmless and to defend and indemnify them from any claim, demand, action, etc. So paragraph 6 is basically a whole harmless provision that we don't want the buyer to come after the agent or come after the broker uh, to say that, hey, nobody told me about this uh, problem, this defect on the property, and now I've got to spend all this money and incur all this inconvenience. So this buyer's acknowledgement and release is absolutely critical to have completed unless you have a fully filled out SRPD in our file, okay? Go back to the title, the subtitle, no SRPD or incomplete SRPD. This is exactly what we would want to get. Okay, moving forward, um, we just talked a little bit about the disclosure of known material defects. So I want to talk about repairs. And how I believe, and I've always believed in real estate, that repairs are deal killers. Let's think about the nature of a repair, okay? Because you've got a seller who is emotionally detaching himself from the property. He doesn't care. He's on the way out of the property, and he's going to want to do a repair as inexpensively as he can. He's going to use duct tape and bubble gum, and that's what it takes just to shut that buyer up, just to get that repair uh, through, close the restaurant, and then if it falls apart the next day, he doesn't care anymore, right? On the other side of the coin, you've got a buyer 
He was very emotionally attached to the property. This could be their dream home. And now they're preparing to move in and spend, you know, who knows how much time, how many years in that property. Well, they're not going to want to do repairs the day they move in. So they're going to want a quality, long-lasting repair. And they're going to want something done by a Nevada licensed contractor in most cases. So the seller who wants to do it quick and easy and cheap versus a buyer who wants a quality, long-lasting repair. And you can probably come to the conclusion, like I have, that repairs are deal killers. This is why I have always thought that we should avoid repairs in real estate whenever possible. Now, I say whenever possible. There are some times that the seller is, excuse me, when the buyer is absolutely adamant about getting a repair conducted. how some buyers feel, hey, and since there's nothing me. illegal about asking the seller to perform a repair, then it is our job to facilitate um, what our customer is asking us to do. But more importantly, there are times that repairs can be funding conditions. If you're not sure what a funding condition is, it means when a buyer is getting a mortgage, Obviously, the bank or lending institution is about to invest a lot of money in the property. They want to make sure that the integrity of the property is there. So sometimes, depending on the severity or the nature of the repair, the lender steps in and says, if this repair is not completed, we are not going to give the mortgage. We're not going to fund the loan. And there's the term, there's where it comes from, funding condition. So... Especially in an FHA situation, if the appraiser decides that something is a funding condition, well, that's going to have to be a repair that gets done, or no mortgage, and of course, no mortgage means no transaction. So, try to avoid repairs. Uh, repair issues are deal killers, opposing interest, cheap versus good, okay? So, if we can get away from asking the seller to perform a repair, so if it's not a funding condition, and we don't have a situation where the buyer is adamant, and this is probably the majority, the vast majority, Majority, in my opinion, of repair issues. I want to go over what the options can be. Okay? One of the options that we can do is a loop, or instead of doing repairs, we can simply adjust the price of the house. So let's say that a repair is conducted and it reveals that the uh, air conditioner is on its last leg. Rather than ask the seller to change out that air conditioner, maybe we can get an estimate of the cost, and we can actually reduce the price of the property by that cost. Now, that is an excellent idea in a cash transaction. Because if you think about it, buyers and sellers take closing costs based on the actual contract price. So in a cash transaction, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to close at X amount of dollars and then give it credit back to the buyer because the buyer and seller are both going to pay closing costs based on that contract price, as I said. So reducing the price is an option. The second option we have to address repairs, unless they have to be done, is to issue a credit at closing escrow. Now, we have language that we're going to talk about in just a minute to, uh, to accomplish that goal. This is the option that is best suited for a buyer who is getting financing on a property. Because if we were to use my first strategy just to reduce the contract price, if we take that amount of price reduction and we amortize that over a 15-year or a 30-year mortgage, that is going to be a negligible difference in the mortgage payment. It's not something that the buyer is going to appreciate. And if he does have to do that repair, he's not going to have the cash on hand, at least from the purchase, to go ahead and, and do that repair. So what I recommend in a financed transaction is not to reduce the purchase price, 
but to get an actual credit at the time of closing. And we're going to come back and talk about the language of that in just a moment. And then my least favorite option, of course, is to go ahead and ask the seller to do those repairs. And we're going to be talking about the way to do that in just a few minutes as well. Okay, so the options when we need some uh, repairs done or when we have some repair issues, some deficiencies on a property, would be to reduce the price in a cash transaction, would be to issue a credit from the seller to the buyer in a finance transaction, or if they are funding conditions, to go ahead and request the seller to do those repairs. So, let me bring your attention to the clause library for class three. Go ahead and get that in front of you. And I'd like to bring your attention specifically to clause 3.01. Which says, seller and buyer hereby agree that seller shall contribute X amount of dollars toward buyer's recurring and non-recurring closing costs upon and as a condition of successful Close of that script. So there you've got that clause in front of you. That clause has been tested and tried and proven many, many times over the years. I love that clause. Let's go back and look at it in more detail. So seller and buyer hereby agree that seller shall contribute X amount of money. So that is the credit that we're talking about. This is the scenario for a finance transaction. It goes on to say, toward buyers recurring and non-recurring closing costs. So recurring is something that happens over and over again. Non-recurring is something that happens only one time. Recurring and non-recurring are polar opposite words, right? They're diametrically opposed. And if we take recurring and non-recurring and we put them together, we have actually covered every possible scenario, every possible type of closing cost. And by using that phrase, recurring and non-recurring, we are setting up, um, what's a good phrase to call it, maybe a slush fund for the buyer that he can use for his closing costs, or he could actually cash that out of closing, use it for the repairs, he could take a vacation with it, uh, or he could put it all on the mega bucks machine, whatever. He chooses to do that. It's going to be his money unequivocally. And then if you finish the sentence, the clause finishes by saying, upon and as a condition of successful close of escrow. Meaning, if we can't close escrow, the buyer is not going to get that money. So I love that clause. Now, sometimes, as I mentioned, repairs can't be avoided, specifically when they are funding conditions. So I would like next to bring your attention to the request for repair form. Please make sure that you have that in front of you so you can understand exactly what we're talking about. And um, the first thing you'll notice about this form at the top is it says request for repair number blank. That's because we number these sequentially. So often, when the buyer submits a request for repair, which would be request number one, the seller will come back with perhaps number two, maybe the buyer will come back with number three, on to number 37, no, I hope that doesn't happen to you. But the point is, we number these sequentially. And just as a reminder, with any form that we number sequentially, we never reuse a number, even if that number was not effectuated, okay? If it was completely disregarded and moved on, we never reuse a number. That way we can always reference back to the document that was drafted. It says at the top, in reference to the residential purchase agreement dated blank on property known as, so we fill in the date, we fill in the address, executed by buyer and seller. I get that language. It's not even correct, but we can't mess with the association's forms, right? So we fill in the buyer's name, we fill in the seller's name, and it brings us to paragraph number one, which is entitled Buyer's Notice. It says, check one. Not none, not two, check one. So the only way we can accept this for one at TR Realty is if there is one box that has been checked. The first choice says, buyer has reviewed and approved the home inspection report and removed the home inspection contingency. So in the case where the buyer has already done his inspection, received
received and reviewed his report. He's okay with the condition of the property. He's not going to do any more inspections during his due diligence period. He can check this first box. And then all the way down the bottom of the first page, he will sign, he will date, and even though there's not a place built in, he will sign this form as well. And if the buyer chooses that first choice, reviewed and approved the home inspection report, then we are good. The buyer's okay, and he's proceeding towards closing. The second choice here says, buyer requests that the seller perform the following repairs before COE. All repairs, except general home maintenance, are to be done by a licensed Nevada contractor. Buyer reserves the right to approve the repairs and walk-through inspection as set forth in the purchase agreement. Buyer acknowledges that this request for repair does not absolve the buyer of any obligation under the RPA. And then we have a very, very lengthy blank section of the form where an agent can easily get in trouble. Black space is always the most dangerous section of any form because agents feel compelled to practice law without a license and start creating language and writing stuff and amending they don't know what the hell they're doing. So don't do that. I'm going to show you a very simple way to handle this paragraph. You already have the inspection report in your possession before you're able to do the request for repair, right? Does that make sense? You can't ask for repairs if you don't know what's wrong with the property. So, of course, we have the inspection report. So this is what I would do to keep yourself out of trouble and to make it simple. Because we're in the business of real estate. We're not in the business of construction. So we don't understand things, okay? The inspector has already written the language for us. He's already talked about the crack in the marble shower pan in the master bathroom. He's already talked about the sagging roof truss on the southwest corner of the second floor. He's talked about these things in detail as he's in his report. So, all we're going to do is cite the page, paragraph, and line number of the deficiency. That's simple. We're not going to recreate any of the language. So, example, we would put number one, page two, paragraph six, line twelve. Number two, page seven, paragraph one, line four. Just examples. And then, if you look about 80% or so of the way down the first page of this form, it says copies of the following reports are attached. We would then check the box, and we would attach to this request for repair. You don't have to attach the whole inspection report. In fact, I'd recommend you don't. We would only attach the relevant pages. The pages that address the deficiencies, we want to be corrected. So there in those blind lines, we are itemizing number one, number two, number three. We are specifying the page, paragraph, and line number in the inspection report. We go down the bottom, we check the box, we write in the name of the report, such as inspection report, and then we go ahead and we attach those relevant pages. You might be thinking, why are there so many lines down the bottom, so many boxes I could check? Well, it's because some buyers choose to have multiple inspections. They could do a sunlight inspection. They could do a structural inspection. They could do a well inspection if there's a well on the property. They could do a mechanical inspection. There's all different kinds of things. That's why the form gives us space and the opportunity to do that. There's another way we could use paragraph one as well. We could simply ask for money. We could say, in lieu of the following repairs, buyer requests either to adjust the purchase price or uh, to get a credit at closing. Let's move on to the second page of this form. Seller's response. Check one. Not three, not two, not blank. Check one. Again, that's the only way we can accept that it's the real The first choice, 
seller agrees to correct all of the conditions listed in section one. So basically, whatever the buyer asks for in section one, the seller's on board with that. He is acquiescing to the buyer's request. He's going to do exactly what the buyer wants. The second choice is seller declines buyer's like request for want to be repairs. Prepared, so whatever the buyer asked for in paragraph one, the seller said, no, he's not going to do any of that stuff. Or the third choice, seller offers to repair or take other specified corrective action as follows. And in that paragraph two, this is where the listing agent and the seller can indicate by itemizing, yeah, we're going to do repair number two, we're going to do repair number five, etc. So if you followed my advice in paragraph number one by numbering and keeping it very, very simple and clear, then it's easy for the seller to respond in paragraph two. Yes, I'm willing to do this. No, I'm not willing to do that. Okay? So the three choices again, seller is willing to do everything the buyer wants, seller is willing to do nothing the buyer wants, or the seller is willing to do some of what the buyer wants. And this paragraph two is another place where money could be proffered in lieu of those repairs. And that happens quite a bit, actually, unless there are funding con uh, conditions that it would be okay to do that, where the seller says, oh, the buyer's asking me to do this and this and this, and I don't want to do it, I don't have, or don't want to spend the money right now, I'm in the middle of moving, this is a headache, this is a hassle, I don't know who to call, so I'm just going to, you know, give you a credit proposal. That could be used uh, in paragraph two as well. And regardless of which of the three options the seller chose in paragraph two, he needs to go ahead and sign uh, after paragraph number two. Now, if the buyer asks for something in paragraph one and the seller agreed to it in paragraph two, we're done with this form. That's it. That's simple. But if the seller did not agree, if he either declined or he picked and chose what he wanted to do, now we're going to take this down to paragraph number three, which is entitled, very strangely, buyer's reply to seller's response. Not sure who created that amazing English. And here in paragraph three, the buyer is responding to whatever the seller said in paragraph number two. And the choice is on, notice it says check one. Buyer accepts seller's response as noted in section two. So whatever the seller responded in section two, the buyer's okay with that. Hey, let's move towards closing. Or buyer rejects the seller's response and rescinds the purchase agreement. Or buyer rejects the seller's response as noted in section two of this request, elects to offer the seller a new request as set forth in the attached request for repair number, perhaps two, and buyer further requests a blank calendar day extension of the due diligence period. My recommendation here is somewhere between three and five. Now, red alert here. This is class three, my buyer's class. When you get to my video series on class five, where we're actually dissecting the purchase and sale agreement line by line, concept by concept, you're going to discover that the due diligence period in our RPA is hard. Now, if we go back in time, okay, I think it's only like 2016 or so. The paragraph in the RPA for due diligence used to say, not anymore, it used to say that the due diligence period shall be called and extended by the same number of days it takes the seller to respond. So back then, if the seller thought about it, if the seller wanted to get some estimates or whatever, it wasn't taking away the buyer's due diligence period. That ship has sailed. Because now the due diligence period is hard. Meaning, if the buyer's agent submits the request for repair to the listing agent, and the listing agent and or the seller just sit on it for a while, 
they can actually run out the buyer's due diligence clock. And you know, as the broker, this is one of the most painful messages for me to get from one of my agents. Uh, Brad, my buyer's due diligence period expired yesterday, and the seller never responded to our request for repair. Well, guess what? You just got beaten by the other agent. The other agent did that intentionally in most cases. They let the clock run out. And folks, if you let that clock run out without some type of agreement between the buyer and seller, you put your buyer in a very difficult position. Because now, either he has to accept the home in the condition it's in without the repairs, or he can wave goodbye to his earnest money deposit. This is how agents get sued. So don't let that happen. And that's why in paragraph three, built into the paragraph, there's a request to extend the due diligence period. Pay very careful attention to that. So, if we are using paragraph three, meaning if the buyer and seller didn't agree above, now the buyer is going to uh, sign and date, and I like the time, as you know by now. And that's how I study for my for the sole purpose of agreeing or denying that extension of the due diligence period. Now, should the seller deny extending the due diligence period, the only way to protect the buyer is to send a cancellation. Again, don't let the due diligence clock expire without a resolution. Some agents have been practicing real estate a thousand years. They haven't been to a training class since the Nixon administration, and they might remember the time that the due diligence period automatically extends. It does not. So if you're a buyer's agent watching this video, and you request for repair, uh, you use a request for repair document, seller doesn't agree, we're down to paragraph three now, the buyer wants to send a new request for repair, make sure you get that due diligence diligence period extended, or go ahead and send that cancellation again. So folks, that is the request for repair document. Now, I want to share a little strategy with you. When I sold real estate, I was a little bit aggressive. Now, I hope that word doesn't have any kind of a negative connotation to you, because when I say I was aggressive, what I really mean is I was an advocate for my client. Okay? I don't work for the other agent. That agent is on the other side of the table. And often, that agent has a very different interest than I have. I work for my client. So when I say I'm aggressive in real estate, it means I advocate for my client. The loan estimate, your disclosures, this is when the processor collects all your documents, your pay stubs, your tax returns, your credit report, uh, where your down payment's coming from, the updated, the finalized purchase contract, the title report, escrow, you sign all that information and prepping everything to go in line for underwriting. You want to make sure you have the most updated pay stubs, the most updated bank statements. If you're using a 401k or an IRA or retirement, you have the most updated quarterly statement for them to underwrite because you don't want to get conditioned for them. You will get conditioned for updated information. Yeah, so why waste your time? You want to make sure the pro you give the processor the record, everything okay? they need but for them to review it. So the once the that side, happens, hey, before it goes in line for underwriting, before you sign anything, you want to look at the loan estimate. When you're looking at the loan estimate, I want you to pay attention to, number one, what is the interest rate on the loan? Number two, on the top right corner of page one, it will tell you if the loan is locked or not. You want to pay attention to that because you want to know where you stand with your interest rate. In the next section, page two, this is where the funny business happens. You want to pay attention to page two, section A and B, that's where the lender can control the fees. Last but not least, section J, the lender credit. You want to reaffirm everything with 
you are the loan officer. Hey, this is my interest rate. These are the fees. Is this correct? Before you go ahead and sign the loan estimate, sign your disclosures, turn in anything, right? This is a moment where you want to know that this is what you're going to get in your loan. Also, you have time to shop it. You might only have a day or two, but you want to verify these numbers first. So that's step two. You gather everything, make sure everything is updated. Then the next step is step three. Your loan approval. Congratulations, your loan is approved. There's two types of loan approvals. It's a conditional approval and a final approval. This is your conditional approval. So conditional approval is where they'll ask you for new information, especially if you have old stuff that are over 30 days old, old bank statements that are over 60 days old, old statements that are like two quarters back, whatever outdated information you need. I think it's a good time to get your 30 day notes because you should be signing docs within three days after the CD goes out, right? But if the CD doesn't go out, that means there was conditions that weren't met, number one. Number two, the value of the appraisal came in short. Remember, when you order appraisal in step four, in step five, they verify it. So this is where the renegotiation happens. Number one, you've got to come up with a difference. You've got to come up with a difference, and your assets don't prove that you have the money. You're going to have to get another bank statement from one of your other accounts, source it, season it, and see if you have enough. Number two, you negotiate. You come in with half, the and the seller backs off half, you might have to show another company. bank statement right? if you don't have Chances enough money. The buyer, or, number three, the seller caves in because they don't want to go through this process again. Through, they know if another buyer the buys a house, the value is going to come in short, especially with FHA and VA, the appraisals are logged in. They can't really switch out the appraisal and get a new one. So if FHA, VA, a lot of times the seller will either ask you to come up with a difference or they'll drop the price because they know if another FHA or VA buyer Okay, through, they're going to have to go with the okay, same right. appraisal. So sometimes if they, they relist the it, they'll say, I only want a conventional of offer the time, because you know not bring the, the FHA or VA appraisal did not appraise. So the this is where the, so the anxiety the comes in because this is the unknown. Is it going to clear? Is it not going to clear? In your mind, you're like, I'm not turning on my conditions. What's going on? The loan officer's not calling back. Oh, my God. The value came in short. I don't have enough money. Step five. I feel like it's a common store. So step five is what you really want to emphasize. Hey, are my conditions clear? Am I missing anything else? Ride your loan officer and processor until you get to step five. Because you want to get to step six. Loan docs are out. Do you sign your CD? It's been three days. The loan docs go out. So with the loan docs go out, you have two options. Number one, a notary can come to your house or to your work and sign you if there's more than one. Multiple people, they can sign both of them. If they're both at work, so some notice go to each person, and it's two sets of docs you gotta sign. One for each person. Or step two, you can go sign at the escrow. If you go sign at escrow, the escrow fee is typically a lot cheaper. Also, if you have questions about fees, escrow people will probably be more accurate than using a random notary. Some people use their cousins as notaries, or they use someone who's a notary. There's two types of notaries. Notaries that notarize for each so and there's notice that right notarize everything. There. The guys that do everything the sometimes I'd like to talk about uh, here or savings to wire it in. Wherever it is, package. if it's a gift from your but donor, you want your donor to wire from their the account over to escrow. You don't want to wire it to your CIC account. CIC now you have to source it again. Package. We want to and minimize our paper trail. You want to short sales right into escrow, right? So once you march in, you bring your money in the all going to purchase a home, but you got to make sure you take care of it first, right? Let your loan officer know. If you do have very peculiar income, you want to make sure you get it underwritten. So not all lenders, but a lot of lenders now are doing these underwritten rules, right? They're as good as cash. So a lot of times, you'll see the pre-approval, and then the lender will start with the underwritten rules. They'll start asking for conditions. Don't feel like, oh my God, why are you asking for so many conditions? Remember, you're getting the underwritten Many of done them are so when you find the house, guess what? Therefore, your loan is done. So ask your lender, hey, do you do underwritten approvals or do you just do pre approvals? Especially if you don't have peculiar income, you want that underwritten approval to 
make sure we had that you minimize your risk of falling agents, out of you know, escrow. Who, so that's the difference were, between being pre approved to, uh, and under approved. The deal. Make sure you ask your lender what type of approval, approval of course, will you send you. Guys, um, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate uh, all the comments, all the thank yous, right? If you're not following me on Instagram, please go to our Instagram. Go to look up what's a mortgage. And of course, we want to add. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another real estate video. This is Javier Vidanya, the real estate YouTube guy here in Phoenix, Arizona, helping you over to you. In Arizona, it gets sent to you through the. If you work with a mortgage broker, odds are after two or three months of owning your house, they sell your. Just to double check, this is overkill, but the worst thing that could happen is they're to each other. Reimbursing situation going on. This is a seller expense now as per Nevada law. You also need to know that Nevada law gives the buyer, we learned this um, in an earlier video, right? Gives the buyer Looking for a property a that's priced right in South Palm Springs? Right of cancellation. Hello everyone and welcome to another real estate that one for free you're paying in some house, some way. The next one is a DPA fund fee. This is a fee that you wouldn't have seen if you would have done a regular down payment loan, but that's $400. After that is the origination fee, the processing fee, tax service, and underwriting. So these four fees are the fees that... So if you're out researching lenders and you're trying to ask more informed questions, I would ask for these questions. Hey, what's your origination fee, your processing fee, your underwriting fee? You like additional... Uh, Impounds or people that standard, it would only be a job for you know whatever. Um, it, it is shop. Warren Buffett is the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway and is considered by many to be the most successful investor in the world. He went from delivering papers and owning pinball machines to becoming known as the Wizard of Omaha with a net worth of over seventy-one billion dollars. Need motivation? Watch the top ten of the Lady Nation. Top ten. Now there's two things that can hold you back in getting somebody said, how do you beat Bobby Fischer? You play many games except chess. I don't play Bobby Fischer or chess. <laughs> And that's, there's a lot of value in learning that over time and with integrity. The nice thing about so intellectually, I know a lot. That. I did not know a lot about human behavior and that, that you can't really, really out of reading books, but it's, it's very important to understand people. And uh, I say to the students, you know, just imagine my, you know, I was lucky I'd saved about 10000 And you come in, you promise you're going to take action. Much more common, we would put the listing agent's name. And then where it says delivery resale package four, we would fill in the name of the association. Because next week shows me all my financials in one place. If you have a property that's located in the area where you get a few or some cases even three associations, we're going to need one of these receipts for each of the properties that is the mortgage or your rent. So we're delivering the package to, we fill in the name of the buyer's agent, and then we go to the bank and get this commercial real estate loan in the situation. You don't have a place to live, so now you're going to have to go and find another home to live in yourself, and you're going to have to make a rent payment or a mortgage payment. And chances are, this money that's left over after paying off whatever vacancy is come up, is not going to be enough to cover your entire mortgage. So they decided to pay your mortgage for you. You can deliver mortgage free because you don't have a housing payment. Your neighbors are paying for you. You're putting an extra $125 in your pocket every single month. And your now, neighbors are helping you build equity. And then you can have your tenants, your neighbors, pay your rent every single month. And now your neighbors are paying for your mortgage. They're not allowed to get if you're buying it as an investment property. But here's the dilemma. If you move out of this property, okay, it's really a place that. to live, right? So you so lived in this property here, for a year. You're going to have to get a mortgage for every financing mortgage. You can read this article on our blog. 
is the seed and that is how we start counting our five hours a day clock. And then it says in hard copy or electronic format, which Fire agrees to accept. And here's why it says that. Nevada law allows the buyer to get paper if he wants paper. Now, in today's day and age, virtually no associations are using paper anymore. If you go back to the time that I was actively selling real estate, retail packages 